Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Content warning for brief mentions of sexual assault. We have an update to our last episode about modern contraceptives. In that episode, we discussed indigenous girls having IUDs forced upon them in the 1990s. It has come to our attention that this is still happening now. It is really fucking messed up. And honestly, we probably should have known. I wanted to live in my safe American white bubble and think like, wow, that's terrible. And I assume a law has been put in place since then or something like that. But of course it hasn't. And we learned that people who have contacted us directly have either been in foster situations or are foster parents themselves with children in their care who have IUDs in them right now as a contraceptive measure against sexual assault. So we just wanted to let everyone know that we do keep up to date with each of the cases that we present. And when there is a correction, we'd like to make it. So we don't want to contribute to the narrative that this is in the past because it is not in the past. It is still happening and it is still something that needs to be addressed. Forced sterilization should never, ever be the answer to rape, period. Mm -hmm. If you ever have corrections, feel free to reach out to us. We will do our best to try to ensure that we get all of the information the first time around, but we are not perfect. So thank you to everybody who we have been interacting with on TikTok who has brought this to our attention. Sorry for the upfront sexual assault mention. The rest of the episode will not have that. And so without further ado, we bring you the season two premiere episode on fentanyl. It's season two time. Oh, yes. Here we are. Welcome to season two. We made it. And in season two, we're starting off with a guest. Okay. Would you like to introduce our guest of honor? I would love to introduce our guest. So I think that the story behind the reason we have this guest on is really funny because she's not an expert in poisons by any means. But mm -mm. Venus, you were like, oh, I have this TikTok friend who we hype each other up and she's great. And then you showed her to me and I was like, yeah, I know her. And you were like, how do you know her? And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? How do I know her? I went to high school with her. <laughs> and I was so sad because I really thought that this was my TikTok friend and we hyped each other up. And then when I ta started talking about the podcast, she came and followed us on Instagram, hyping us up over there. And so... I thought that I introduced her to the podcast and was very sad when I found out it wasn't, but it's a small world Indeed. to find out that me and my hype beast knew my co-host. Right. So without further ado, people of the podcast, I present to you model and artist, Saucy Stassi. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you guys. I'm so excited to be here for season two. Like, all the hype. Y'all yes. doing big things. Oh, we're so and excited to have guests. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here because I'm really unsure about poisons, but I like listening to a bunch of stuff. So I'm like, yeah, I'm educated. <laughs> <laughs> you are. That's what Kayla's job is. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We come She's... in with the, the spongy minds and she fills it with the knowledge. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> knowledge is good. It's power. So you wanted to talk yeah. about fentanyl. So yes. what case made you want to talk about fentanyl? What made me want to talk about fentanyl is the case of Bailey Henke. He was this, you know, poor young chap who was struggling with depression, going through his life. You know, we all been there. But he picked up some heroin, so he thought. But it so happened that it was laced with <laughs> fentanyl and he lost his life, which is very sad. It's not a fair game, but it unraveled into this whole big thing of the trade through mail and all these crazy things coming from China, fentanyl. I don't really have all the deets, but that's what got me started wanting to know more about fentanyl. 
Yeah. How did you even hear about this case? Because I was shocked that I'd never even heard of this case. Same. It's because I'm a podcast beast and all (laughs) I do is I'm like, oh, I'm done with this podcast. I need a new one. And it was, I think, like painkillers. The Vice Uh, one. Yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I listened to that and I was just like, oh, that's so interesting because fentanyl is like, I used to have an issue with drugs and the cocaina. And I just remember my uncle being like, be careful. Like a lot of stuff coming in is laced with fentanyl when it comes out of Mexico. I don't Mm -hmm. know the whole trade of this. It's crazy. And I was just like, oh, sure. Maybe I'll die. Maybe I won't. Mm -hmm. But this shit's really killing people. And it's come back up recently in Colorado, which is also very horrifying, of just being laced and stuff. And I heard about some cases in Florida where people think they're buying weed. And it's just, I don't get why everybody's lacing things with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. I'm confused about it. Yeah, that's something that I don't really, I, I understand it from a price standpoint as far as for the drug dealer like Mm -hmm. my understanding is that it is more economically enriching to sell fentanyl than to sell heroin but it's really scary with heroin and coke there's some kind of inherent risk but thinking about it being on just pot that's wild that's an odd one i haven't heard of people lacing actual marijuana with that i could definitely see the synthetic marijuana being Mm. laced with it just because When you're doing the synthetic marijuana thing, anything is really possible. All bets are Mm -hmm. off. Yeah. In Colorado, where we all live, we do have a pretty direct line straight up from Mexico if you take one of the interstates and then it spreads Mm -hmm. out. So Denver is a drug hub. But fentanyl originally started as a major issue on the east and west coast, population density probably mostly. But they were having all these issues with things being laced and long-time heroin addicts dying suddenly, even though they, you know... They were doing something dangerous, but they did know what they could tolerate, and they were just trying to get through their lives and didn't want to do the methadone thing, and they were dying because of drugs being laced with fentanyl. And so then they were trying to find ways to test for it among drug user populations, not necessarily on, like, the DEA level or anything. And now with the fentanyl problem, all of those solutions to the problems have also moved towards Denver and towards those sparser population areas. But it's, yeah, it's... It's bad. It's just bad everywhere now. It sucks. Yeah. It was in small towns, right? Like the oil towns that, not oil towns specifically, but like little towns where all the workers, the work had gone. So they all just had their addictions. It was small towns as well as large towns. The reporting I mostly heard was like out of Philadelphia, but I think that's just because Mm -hmm. that's how I would hear it in Denver is that it was a large media source reporting on it so Mm -hmm. yeah I would assume wherever the work is wherever the people are it was just a problem everywhere so what makes fentanyl so much more dangerous than heroin fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin so if you had a half gram of heroin and a half gram of fentanyl the half gram of fentanyl is going to be significantly more dangerous so if you're a user and you're doing your thing and you don't know that there's fentanyl in it. I mean, I can understand why the overdose deaths are so numerous with this problem. Totally. Because it's not a small amount. Like, it's not like you're taking a painkiller and you're used to taking like a 10 milligram and, oh, it was a 20 milligram. Right. That's a huge difference. And I guess while we're talking about painkillers, fentanyl's an opioid, right? Yes. Which is different than opiates. How? So an opioid is a narcotic analgesic that is at least part synthetic and is not found in nature, whereas an opiate is a narcotic analgesic that's derived from the opium poppy. So morphine, heroin, those are all derived from the poppy plant, and so they are opiates. And anything that's trying to mimic that is an opioid. Got it. Due to my chronic illness journey, I have had plenty of stays in the hospitals and multiple surgeries where I've had strong painkillers. And there was, I've noticed a big shift from when I was in my early 20s. It was always like morphine or Dilaudid. Mm -hmm. And the last few years when I had my surgeries or when I was in the hospital, it's been fentanyl. Do you know why like the kind of surge in popularity? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure 
why that would be because it is so potent and it is kind of dangerous. I mean, in a medical setting, it's somewhat less dangerous, but it, it still is very potent. And traditionally, I don't think they tend to use fentanyl in a medical setting unless you're going under and they want that analgesia for you going under. So I don't think I've ever done fentanyl, but I've had two surgeries where I possibly could have had fentanyl. And honestly, sometimes in my mind, especially under the stress of a surgery, I confuse it with propofol. And so right. they, they might have been like, you're taking fentanyl. And I was like, I'm taking propofol. That makes sense. I'm going, so, you know. And then, <laughs> But it could have been just the nature of your pain. Did they administer it with a slow release tablet or was it administered transdermally? For my last surgery that I had last year, it was mm-hmm. in, I had an epidural. So, epidural. Okay. Yeah. so I had it in my epidural and then there was a hospital trip before that where I had really severe pain and mm-hmm. they did it in my IV. Interesting. The epidural makes sense as far as like surgical reasons. It would make sense that they would use fentanyl, but just straight into your IV. That's an interesting one. It could have been that they just wanted to not fill your body. And I think that there's different pharmacokinetics they were probably playing with okay. so that it would last longer or they could give you smaller doses over periods of time instead of one large bolus that wears off. So I'm not entirely That makes sure. sense. Yeah. No, that yeah. second one makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So quick question for the layman listener. I get what an IV is. Where is the epidural going? Is that in your bag? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of the same as when pregnant women get an epidural for labor, but yeah, they put it into your spine. And so okay. it's like direct hookup. And so it's directly in there. And it was just because it was a really major surgery where they cut me like top of my torso straight down. And so mm-hmm. it was there for like three days. And then you just have your sweet pump. That gives you the goods straight to, I don't know the science behind an epidural as to why it's in the back. Is it because it's a more direct input? (laughs) I think it's something like that where it doesn't necessarily spread to the whole body. Like because the spinal column is buffered or encased kind of with the cerebral spinal fluid that keeps the spine and the brain and everything happy and cushy. I think that it travels along that and through your body in a different way than if you were to put it in your IV. Got it. Especially if they want your pelvis to not feel pain or your midsection to not feel pain Mm -hmm. rather than like, I've had, yeah, I had an IV injection when I had to get a PET scan and they're like, you're going to feel like you have to pee, Mm -hmm. which is false. You feel like you do pee Mm -hmm. and and your head feels like it's on fire. And Mm -hmm. so like how they want to direct it is probably why they do the epidural. And I know it can go, I know it can go wrong because when my mom had her epidural for giving birth, it only worked on one of her legs. And so her pelvis was not numbed, but one leg she couldn't control where it was going. So it's not great still, but. No, it wasn't. Mine came out actually. (sighs) It came, yeah, it came out while I was in the hospital. And so there was about a three hour (laughs) period where I went from being like on cloud nine. Right. To literally having nothing for my pain. And that was a very bad time. Only imagine. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When I was reading the show notes, Mm -hmm. I saw mention of fentanyl analogs. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Fentanyl is a simple structure. And I was thinking of sharing my screen and showing it to you guys. If you're interested, I can do that. Sure, would love. Okay, let me do that. We'll post these figures or at least something like this on social media. Can you guys see it? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so fentanyl is just this basic structure where you have a benzene ring, a benzene ring, and then a bunch of stuff in the middle. So fentanyl analogs have this basic structure, but you can, in the laboratory, mess with it and add different things to it. So if you look at acetyl fentanyl, for instance, you've lost a methyl group. So if you look at carfentanyl, carfentanyl has the basic structure and then it has the extra oxygen and the methyl group over here, and then it has an entire other carboxyl group over here. And carfentanil is actually used as an elephant tranquilizer. That is how powerful it is. And this is something that is also being used to cut drugs. And so where heroin is twice as strong as morphine, fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin. So fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. Are you guys following my math? Yep, yep, I'm with you. fentanyl is... 10,000 times stronger than morphine. And if people are cutting drugs with that, then like they're surely going to die. 
Right. And it's not super common that they'll do that, but any of these analogs can be made in illicit laboratories with relative ease. And that's part of what they talked about in that VICE podcast. I, I do recommend that people who are interested in what we're talking about now go look at that VICE podcast and go listen to it because they go into detail about where it's made and how it's made. But any of these analogs can be used to cut. And they're not just used because you can make them and they produce this extreme high. You can get a ton of money for it. But they also are making analogs so quickly that they're hard to detect. And so one of the difficulties mm. when I was working at the coroner's office was there was one person who we had on the best instrumentation that we had. A lot of her days were just looking at fentanyl analogs and then trying to get ahead and learn what new ones we had as a community of chemists learned to detect and learned what's out there and then adding that to her library. But you're always one step behind because you're always behind them finding the new one and then putting it out there and then figuring out that you know what the structure is to detect it and then mm. saying this is out here now so they're really easy to make and by creating these analogs you also get around the scheduling and so if, if you have something that's never been made before it can't be scheduled i mean fentanyl itself is scheduled but you can't just say anything with this base structure is scheduled you mean the schedule of like classification of the drug with like the dea like schedule one substance schedule two it's yes. okay gotcha yeah, exactly exactly so so that's kind of alluring for them yeah, as a reason to keep making these. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I just had no idea there were so many. There's a lot. There's a lot, a like, lot. And just there's a like oh, scroll. And it kept <laughs> going. I mean, I only got through part of the A's, but yeah, there's a lot that are out there. And so did you come across when you were at the coroner's office, were there fentanyl deaths in El Paso County? Oh, yes. Yes. And so part of what I wanted to talk about today is they made a big deal out of Bailey Hankey's death because they were able to track it. They didn't think his friend was the one who sold it to him necessarily. But in the Vice podcast, they interviewed the friend and that's the only place I've heard him tell his side of the story at all. But they were trying to charge him with the guy they eventually charged, Brandon Hubbard, as if they were like in cahoots. Mm. And so the friend got it from Brandon, who got it from a guy in Canada, who was getting it from a supplier in Mexico, who was ultimately getting it from these Chinese makers who were covering their tracks really well, but they've been extradited to the U.S. to face charges for this. And it was called Operation Denial. It was this huge, huge DEA operation. And so while that's all going on and while they're like, okay, we're going to try to charge people who sell drugs as murderers, because that's essentially what it was. They were like, we're going to crack down. We're going to start charging people who sell drugs as murderers. While that was happening all across the United States, and even in El Paso County, there were noticeable increases in opioid deaths. And it's only gotten worse since the pandemic, honestly, because people don't have access to the medicine that they used to have access to. They don't have access to help. And everyone's depressed. Everyone's sick. Everyone's dying around us. Everyone's depressed. So opioid deaths have just skyrocketed. Would you like some numbers? I would love all the numbers. Love some numbers. Yeah, I okay. love all the numbers. Let me share my screen again. So I found this data set through the Kaiser Family Foundation. It can be found on kff.org and you can do whatever you want with it. You can look at different states. So what I have pulled up and I can take a screenshot of this and put it on social media is just a graph from 1999 to 2019 of white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and other populations in the United States. And these are opioid deaths. So these are drug overdose deaths from opioids. And there has been a considerable increase, especially among the total population, but also the white population, the white non-Hispanic populations. Some of the other populations have stayed low and they have seen an increase from sub 5,000 to nearing 10,000 in the last, this is from 2014 to 2019, so in a five-year period. But since 1999, the total population has seen almost a five-fold increase in opioid deaths. That's insane. And it's not like fentanyl had just come around. Fentanyl wasn't new in 1999. It's just that mm -hmm. Maybe we were trying to get over issues that we had with cocaine in the 80s or heroin in the 90s, and we were trying to get over that or trying not to make that as easily accessible. And the, there's also the issue with doctors overprescribing opiates, right? That's the one that I was going to bring up. I mean, mm -hmm. that's definitely a problem. And talking about, oh, God, I can't think of the name of the family now. 
I want to say Purdue. That's getting sued. Yes, that's the one. Can't think of their name. I want to say like Sanders. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, you look that up. Because the marketing that they did with doctors was absolutely disgusting. Like, I mean, it's really predatory. That's the perfect word, actually. That's the perfect word. And there are so many people who needed pain medication and were given pain meds that were way too strong for them. And they're so addictive. And so for years and years, I mean, everybody's just writing these prescriptions like crazy. And Mm -hmm. now doctors are holding on to their prescription pads very close to their chest and making it hard for people who have chronic pain to get the help that they need. And so I feel like that's also part of the reason why people turn to street and illicit drugs, Mm -hmm. like you were saying. And so... Of course, overdoses are going to go up, especially when you throw something as intense as fentanyl. Like when you throw that into the mix, people are going to die. Yeah, I was in a car accident in 2007 and I was just prescribed straight Vicodin. It wasn't the Vicodin that they cut with acetaminophen anymore. It was just Vicodin. And I was 15 years old. And I mean, if you have an addictive personality, it's a clear path from getting Vicodin and getting hooked to trying morphine to trying heroin and then yeah fentanyl especially because it is available in patches and so it is available in these ways that are meant for safety but Mm -hmm. can be extremely dangerous because people can put on multiple patches at a time and fall asleep and fentanyl acts so quickly that it is very easy to overdose if you don't get to somebody in time because you can get to people in time if you have naloxone just like if they have a heroin overdose, but because it acts so quickly and it initiates that respiratory depression so fast, it's very difficult to get to somebody who is overdosing on fentanyl in time to save their life. So in El Paso County alone, because you can find information for like each state's breakdown, so I just decided to look at our county in Colorado Springs, fentanyl-related deaths more than doubled in the past year. And this is a recent article. This is a June 21st, 2021 from the Gazette. So fentanyl-related deaths have doubled in the past year, jumping from 534 in 2020 and from 222 in 2019. And that's just fentanyl. That's not even opioid deaths. That's fentanyl deaths. That's insane. Yeah. Mind blown. Yeah. I don't know if this is too sidebar, (laughs) but I don't get why. What the fuck is it called? Like having safe houses for people that are doing drugs. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the actual name. For it, but instead of wasting all this money trying to catch the people, why don't you just offer a safe space so people don't right. have to die? Right. I agree. Yeah. Well, and people are trying to push for that in the same way that they're trying to push for like clean needle exchange. And so this same article mentions how, along with the fentanyl, we're also getting these strips that they mentioned in the Vice documentary. I had seen it reported for East Coast fentanyl awareness. And you can get these strips where if you take the drug that you have, even if it's cocaine or ecstasy, whatever you have, they're lacing everything with fentanyl. And so you can take it and you can add water to it and dip the strip in. Mm -hmm. And the strip should indicate whether or not there's fentanyl present. And so that's one way that people are trying to help themselves. But yeah, we need a more systemic safety net because people are going to do drugs and they don't deserve to die just because they're doing drugs. No, absolutely not. And that was one of my questions that I had actually for this episode was, are there ways for people to test to Mm -hmm. at least see if they're using so, but are those strips easy to get a hold of? Because that seems pretty important for somebody who's a user. So strips in Colorado are being distributed through the Colorado Health Network's needle exchange program in Pueblo and other parts of the state. But if you don't have a clean needle exchange, if you don't have a safe house, like you said, or halfway house, I imagine that they're not super prevalent. Like we're not just handing them out on the street. I mean, we are, but not just like candy or anything, you know, not in like right. huge numbers. I don't know where to find these things. And especially if it's something that vulnerable populations, like people who are houseless, things like that, they might not even know that this is an issue yeah. at this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why are drug dealers doing this when they're kind of killing their consumers off? Like, I know they're making more money, 
But it also seems like when they're putting these, especially with the fentanyl analogs, like what was the one that you said? The The fentanyl? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're killing off your customer base. I don't think that they're either thinking ahead. They might not know, like how Bailey Henke's friend didn't know that his heroin was laced with fentanyl. But also it's just, it's cheap. I mean, Brandon mm. Hubbard was is saying and a couple different sources I found that he was bringing in millions of dollars, millions of dollars with fentanyl, that he would have been making a fraction of that with heroin because you mm. can upcharge it so much. And so it's very easy to like cut more expensive drugs on the consumer end with something that's going to make you more money. And so if they're cutting it with something that's cheap to them to make, He ended up having to even cut his fentanyl with mannitol. So he was cutting his fentanyl, too, with a sugar substitute. But, like, basically all drugs are cut. And so it's just a matter of what are they cut with. Right. And then also probably morbid way to look at things. But I feel like the consumer constantly will be punished. There will be a new customer. Right. Yeah, there will always be a new customer. And there are addicts. say that from being a personal addict myself is, like, there will always be one. So their only worry is, am I going to get caught? Yeah, they're to their family, whatever, but maybe totally. don't kill a bunch of people. Totally. And as much as I'm like, yeah, don't kill people. Like, I get that, too, where it's like, did he need to be making a million dollars? No, but people do need money. He was in a bad situation himself. Brandon Hubbard was. He was addicted mm-hmm. to painkillers himself. I don't think people realize how dangerous fentanyl is. I think they're starting to get an idea for it now because there is so much reporting like this where people are like, it is dangerous. It is 50 times stronger than heroin. I really wanted to get an LD50 for it, so that lethal dose for 50% of the population so that we could compare it to botulism or, or something that's very, very small, as we said in our very first episode in season one. But there is such a disparity between the experimental numbers that you get in rats and humans the the LD50 in a rat was something like three milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And so for a 150 pound individual, that's about 210 milligrams, which is a lot because fentanyl has actually proven in case studies to be lethal at two milligrams. You can look at the photos they have where they compare like the amount of heroin that can kill you with the amount of fentanyl, but like two milligrams is just a couple of grains of sugar. It is a very, very small amount. And I don't think that people can even fathom how powerful this stuff is, you know? Yeah, I I really like the numbers that you gave us earlier on about how it progresses, you know, mm-hmm. between like morphine than to yeah. heroin. That to, I mean, those are big deals. And that's one of those things that I mean, it does seem like more people are learning about that now, Mm -hmm. but how much of the community who works through addiction is aware of this until it's just common knowledge at some point, but that's scary shit. It's really scary. I had a doctor tell me to my face, fentanyl, it's around everywhere. And I was just like, not going to get me. Yeah. (laughs) fucking crazy it, it'll get you anywhere it'll get you if you mm-hmm. think you're buying heroin if you think you're buying ecstasy didn't you post something else on instagram recently because i messaged you and i was thinking mm-hmm. of this conversation you posted something in your store and all i could message back was fuck like yeah what, what, what it was, was that? about so pretty much it's an urgent psa this past weekend three people died from fentanyl contaminated cocaine overdoses in denver colorado the presence of fentanyl in this cocaine has been confirmed by laboratory testing we also have been informed of suspected fentanyl contamination in both mdma and methamphetamine in denver not yet confirmed by lab testing but probable Yeah. Yeah. And so like it can be cutting things that don't even have the same effect that you're going for. You don't take Mm -hmm. fentanyl when you want to get high on coke, but it's cutting cocaine. Yeah. I have friends who will every once in a blue moon decide like we're going to get some coke and we're going to have a crazy weekend. And so they're not regular users of, you know, things like that. And then to think like, If they got something like that, when it's going around, that's scary enough for me to be like, hey, guys, maybe not. Because it's, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Or just, or same with Molly. Like, you don't know. If anything's going to scare you straight. (laughs) (laughs) 
shake it into you. <laughs> shake it into you. Maybe it's this because that's that's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had another friend reach out based on that story and said one of his friends that went to a party, like six people ended up going to the hospital. Yeah. Like they each did a line. Yeah. And- yeah. You're right. That reminds me of another part of this story. So Brandon Hubbard, the guy who sold the heroin that was cut with the fentanyl that killed Bailey Hankey, they were able to track him and then they arrested him. And he was talking to his girlfriend and he needed her to go pick up a softball size ball of fentanyl, which is so Mm -hmm. much fentanyl when you know how much can kill you. He needed her to go (laughs) dig it out of the backyard so that it wouldn't be found when the DEA raided their place. And she was trying to be all sneaky and called him while he was in prison and was like, I'm trying to plant tomatoes in the backyard. Where's the best place to plant the tomatoes? And so in all this coverage, they have the line where the DEA agent shows up while she's digging up the fentanyl. And they're like, where are the fucking tomatoes, Channing? (laughs) Right. And so she gets arrested. And while she's in jail, she sells fentanyl to three other inmates. And one of them dies. Did she she get charged with it? Yeah, of course she got charged with it. She smuggled it in in her body in like a condom and then distributed it. And the one who died didn't even buy it from her. They traded it for a honey bun, which is just like... Tragic. Now you're going to be serving time because you killed somebody with fentanyl. And they are trying to charge people with murder now. Vice Mm -hmm. squads are all about, Mm -hmm. like, we'll find the people and we'll charge it with murder. But then there's the whole side to that where that's not really doing very good for the community. That's really just incarcerating BIPOC people at a significantly higher rate than it was before, which, surprise, surprise, the, the war on drugs is doing that. And it's just getting people in the middle and it's getting family and friends who sold or shared with somebody who then they ended up losing and now they're being charged with their murder. Right. You know, kind of like how they wanted to originally charge Bailey Henke's friend. And I don't think they did. I don't Mm -hmm. think that they ended up charging him and it ended up, you know, going out to everybody else. But still, that's what they're trying to do. And it's just proving to be super ineffective to be charging these people with murder. And because somebody else is just going to fill their shoes is the thing. Well, Mm because you're just getting the people at the very end of the stream. You're not getting the upstream producers of mass amounts. I mean, it sounds like in that Operation Denial, they were working towards getting some of Mm -hmm. the bigger people who were involved. But with other cases, not this case in particular, with doing that, you're just making people suffer. And I know you wanted to talk about the Good Samaritan laws. And so, like, it's good that we have those because if somebody is ODing, of course you're not going to call if you were sharing with them or selling to them and now they're dying. Right. And so if you don't know, the Good Samaritan law is to protect people who report an overdose. So if Kayla and I are shooting up and Kayla starts ODing, like I should not be afraid to call for help because it is very important that when somebody's overdosing, that you get them help as quickly as possible. The longer it goes on, the less chance that they're going to be okay. Yeah. So that is helpful. My knowledge of it is that it's not in every state, mm-hmm. sadly. And some states, the coverage varies between yeah. what's okay. But the point of the story is call for help. It's not yeah. worth it. And I mean, I'm totally on defund the police and like, let's get away from having law enforcement show up for when you have a health or mental health emergency. Mm-hmm. And so like, especially if you have problems like this, get trained in how to use naloxone, have naloxone in your home. There's really no option but to call 911, and 911 will call police, fire, and medical. And hopefully, as we move towards something better than just sending police out on every call, when you call 911, they'll just send out medical. If you don't have naloxone or it's not working, like, just call. And hopefully, you're in a state where the Good Samaritan law will cover you. And if not, do you really want to let that person die? Well, yeah. And do you want to live the rest of your life with that monkey on your back? And so naloxone, is that Narcan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so Narcan can bring somebody back from a fentanyl overdose? It can. But like I said, the window to bring somebody back is very narrow with fentanyl. It's extremely narrow. So what does a fentanyl overdose look like? 
when somebody is overdosing on fentanyl, it looks the same as when somebody's overdosing on any sort of opiate. And so you get that sleepiness and you get the respiratory depression, but it happens more quickly. They'll get dizzy, they'll get confused. They might start to have slow breathing when that respiratory depression starts to kick in. Pinpoint pupiled, the color can start to disappear from their lips and fingernails. They could slip into a coma before they die. And then one of the really interesting things about fentanyl in particular is that it causes chest rigidity that is very similar to the chest rigidity caused with strychnine or tetanus. So hmm. if anybody listened to the Patreon episode about arsenic and old lace, when I talk about strychnine and that severe arching of the back that it causes, it doesn't cause the back arching, but it causes the same sort of chest rigidity. And they've even noticed that in people who use fentanyl when it's administered in surgical practices, because it originally started out as a drug for cardiac surgeries in particular. Mm. And so they noticed that chest rigidity. Hmm. Yeah. So if somebody starts getting a little subdued. Right. right. Call. Which, I mean, I'm sure it's hard to be like, oh, are you just nodding out on heroin? You know, so if they start to lose the color in their face and if they start to have that really slow breathing, like, that's an overdose. As attentive as you can be if you're both on the drugs. Yeah. In a perfect world, everybody would be able to have a buddy to look out for them. Is Narcan easy to get? I think it is. I think it's easy to get. Let me see. Yes. Actually, one of the hyperlinks that you get on Google when you just search Narcan is... Narcan is simple to get. This is from their website. Anyone can purchase Narcan nasal spray directly from a pharmacist without a doctor's prescription. All major pharmacy chains such as CVS, Walgreens, and Rite Aid stock Narcan nasal spray, so it's convenient for you to obtain today. How if much you were, is it? I don't know. <laughs> but that's a good so, question. Their website again says that 49% of prescriptions for Narcan have a copay of $0. And then a bunch have $10 or less and $20 or less. So it sounds like they're making it affordable. 20 bucks is getting a little expensive. I can get that. And I mean, think about it this way. It's $10 on top of whatever you were going to spend. Right. And hopefully you wouldn't have to use it every time. So Mm -hmm. hopefully you could spend that 10 bucks and then it's just an emergency situation. Yeah. It's like an EpiPen for overdosing. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Good thing to have on hand. Addiction is hard, and I am not going to tell anybody you need to get off of drugs. Like, no, I'm not going to say that to anybody because you've got your struggles that I know nothing about. Mm-hmm. But if you are using, try to do it as safely as possible. So I would say, at minimum, have Narcan on hand if you can. Track down some of those strips so that you can test Mm. what you're getting because that could eliminate the accidental overdoses. This is also really late. It's Johnson & Johnson. That's the company that's getting in the settlement thing. Well, and I saw Slacker and Purdue also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically everybody is in it. I know there is that one family that's like big but the like, Sackler yeah. family the yeah. Sackler yeah but everybody every doctor and every mm-hmm. like drug company in the United States they're all listed I've looked at the documents and they're just all on there the settlement's yeah. just sad but I don't know why that was bothering me so I finally <laughs> found it on Google <laughs> thank you thanks so yeah are there any other questions that you guys have The statistics you shared were pretty staggering. And so I guess we will post those on social media because I don't have a lot of questions on those. They're just, that's a lot of people. And to think that in our county, which we don't live in a huge city, Mm -mm. we're nowhere near the size of Denver, Chicago, et cetera. Right. And so to have 500 people die in one year. I mean, you know, it's just significantly worse elsewhere with those higher yeah. population density cities. Exactly. That's so, scary. Do you want to hear another fucked up story about car fentanyl that I found? That's the <laughs> elephant tranquilizer? The elephant tranquilizer, yeah. Yes. I do. So this is unconfirmed, but they theorize that Russian authorities overcame terrorists in a hostage situation in Moscow in October of 2002 by releasing car fentanyl into the air of a movie theater and it's like uh yeah i'm sure you got the guys you were looking for but also the hostages that's and what so I was just gonna... 
650 hostages were hospitalized and 128 died. Ooh, unintended yeah, out, consequences. Out of 800. Like, unintended. It's <laughs> Russia. I don't know. I mean, it's started. Yeah. Yeah, there's, it's not confirmed, but that's what they think happened. And yeah, just. Well, it had to be something. Super messed. They think it was either that or like LSD. And they're not sure, but I've never heard of anybody dying from LSD. That's a, Yeah, you're going to have a bad trip, maybe. Yeah, it'd be a little scary. You're in a dark room and all of a sudden you're like, uh, yeah. the drugs are hitting that I no, don't know I took. In, instead, right. they put this vaporized elephant tranquilizer into the air of a movie theater. And it's like, let's not. Yeah, no offense, Russia, but I'm also not surprised. Same here. I was like, bad judgment. Yeah, that's scary. With the Hinky case, to wrap on that, what did he end up getting charged with? One of the guys he was working with got life. A Rhode Island man was found guilty in association with this whole thing. His name was Stephen Pinto, and he was found guilty for conspiring to import and distribute fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, conspiracy to import fentanyl and fentanyl analogs into the U.S., continuing criminal enterprise, just a laundry list of things. And he was facing a mandatory sentence of 20 years in prison, to which he pleaded guilty. And so I think he got life. I'm pretty sure that Brandon Hubbard got life, that main guy who they found first. I'm pretty sure he got life. Mm -hmm. He was actually really, he was really apologetic. He didn't try to say, like, this isn't my fault. He was like, I was in a bad situation myself, but it ended in somebody's death. And there's no getting around that. So Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he was sentenced to life. Because he also did a bunch of, it's not called mail fraud, but he was sending it through the mail. So distributing drugs through the mail and then the murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and they I, actually linked him to 12 deaths. Oh, oh wow. Mm-hmm. Yep. See, it's kind of a slippery slope with charging the supplier with murder. That's a hard one. I understand what they're trying to do, but it's like, it's just continuing this war on drugs that hasn't right. worked since I've been alive. So No, and there's still people who are sitting in prison mm-hmm. for selling two grams of pot. Don't get me started on the war on drugs. I was going to go on a Reagan rant. I have so many (laughs) rants in me. (laughs) With the whole fentanyl thing, I guess on the non-crime side of it, I don't know if you read the stories or like heard in the podcast how they talked about the guy who got electrocuted and he couldn't like heal his pain with anything outside of using fentanyl. But now, like you were mentioning earlier, that people can't access the help they need. Or get told that they're overdramatic, but that's the healthcare field. And I won't get started on that either. No, it's a mess. I mean, for my endometriosis, my gyno used to give me just a couple of pain pills to get me through my flares. Mm -hmm. And at my last appointment, she told me she literally cannot do that anymore. She has to send me to pain management and pain management has to review and this and that. And it's like, I'm not asking for a lot. When I was in my early 20s, I had a prescription for 100 Demerol a month. And that is why we are in the problem that we have now. But it's just, it went so far to the other side that it's impossible Mm -hmm. for people with chronic pain to get relief a lot of times. And it's really tragic. Yeah. And I mean, I I was thinking that too, when I was listening to the guy's story about he'd been electrocuted and he was pain-free for the first time in 10 years by taking fentanyl. And like, there are good things to it, but there's also good things to most drugs. Heroin started out as a pharmaceutical from Bayer. It was completely legal when it started. And I don't know, like shameless plug for myself. I have a book that I'm working on and it's about the use of poisons as medicine and like every medicine is a poison and every poison Mm -hmm. has the possibility to be used as a medicine so yeah i don't want to totally shit on fentanyl especially when it's made safely and not just in buckets in somebody's garage in mexico Mm -hmm. but like that is where we are and even the patches are dangerous the patches you can put too many on like i said you can one of the guys was talking about squeezing the gel out of a patch and smoking it and like jesus christ don't do that i understand that like you are at a low point in your life when you're doing that but don't do that just don't do that well and it really does go back to our tagline of <laughs> the dose the makes, dose the, makes po- the poison yeah <laughs> like what you did there it's like Absolutely. it's like it makes sense <laughs> or something 
(laughs) But I mean, there's a lot of truth in that. And then when you're getting that from a doctor and you're using it under a doctor's supervision, Mm -hmm. that's different than getting a bag that you're going to go do a line or you're going to go shoot up and you literally have no idea what the concentration is. At least when I had that bottle of 100 Demerol, I knew how much it was Mm -hmm. and I know to not take all of it. But it's hard when you're buying drugs on the street to have that ability to quantify it, I guess. Give people safe drugs. (laughs) Give people safe (laughs) places to do them. I don't know. Do your deal. Let's, you know. Let's be nice to people. Can we Seriously. try to do that? How about Seriously. for the for the rest of 2021, everybody just be nice to each other. Just be nice <laughs> to each other. Break out of this capitalistic society. You're not lacking anything. You have everything you need. That helps <laughs> others. Yes, I am all for this. I like this plan. <laughs> Podcast here to save the world. I feel like I learned a lot. I didn't know there was so much fucking fentanyl or Thank you. I had a question about those. I remember hearing in the podcast that the fentanyl analogs Mm -hmm. were easy to get through the mail. No ideas, listeners, but it was easy to get through the mail because it couldn't be picked up by the drug sniffing dogs. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to even detect fentanyl on instrumentation. Like the instrumentation we were using at the coroner's office was the best. It was the most sensitive and we were still pushing the limits of sensitivity. Like you have to have really, really nice instrumentation. And so the idea that dogs couldn't smell some of them, I totally buy into that, especially if you're only sending a little bit, you know. Well, and if you're only sending a little bit and if they're trained to smell one type of fentanyl and And then they're creating all these other types... I don't know what they smell like. I don't know how they differentiate that. I I know very little about drug sniffing dogs, to be honest. So I'm not sure like how well the dogs do with that sort of thing, but like maybe they smell different. And I don't know if it's easy to cover up with something either. Like if you send a perfume sample and you're sending a magazine to somebody, again, no ideas, anybody out there, you will be found and then you will be charged with male felonies. So don't do anything. But you know, if it is being sent that way, I assume that that if it's a small enough quantity it could be covered up fairly easily as far as the smell goes well now we have started out two seasons with very very (laughs) poisonous substances (laughs) for the size that's not how i want to say that how do i want what's the right wording kayla substances that are extremely toxic in low doses so I guess I'm setting a precedent here. Yes. That's good. You'll all Thanks, do yourself Stassi. each time. No, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I enjoy learning. No, this was a really good topic. Really good topic. Thanks. Poison's interesting. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for season two. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>